Hi, Pity. What's going on, guys? Just tightening up the machine here. Wind up the monkeys. All right, we're ready to go whenever you guys are. Copy, thank you. Um, just a quick disclaimer real quick. You might want to throw the disclaimer up right after because um, it's already scrolled past. So. so do the disclaimer after? No, that's good. He just threw it up on the screen. So, All right, take it away whenever you're ready. Three, two, one. Hi. Welcome, everyone. This is Hippocampus 88. I'd like to first off thank you guys for taking time out of your busy schedules. I'm sure you've heard of uh, USN and his share and or know his knowledge base. And I'm going to be turning this beginning part of the presentation over to him for our first go. Again, here at AHC 88, we appreciate you all for your patriotic hearts. Please be advised to reread our disclaimer at any time. And USN's going to read that out for us now. So, USN, you have the floor. Thank you, Hippocampus. Good evening, everyone. I am USN. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening to our first podcast this evening on emergency management and survival. Our disclaimer to begin with, this is to ensure that there's no confusion. This is not any call to arms. We are not about revolution or anti-government. We are not, um, none, none of this organization is about anti-government. We are pro-American. We stand by the Constitution of the United States of America. And we claim our right as sovereign individuals to remold our great nation into MAGA, make America great again. God bless America. Thank you all. I'd like to begin tonight by introducing some of our core members of our group. We have Hippocampus 88. We have Docs, Staka, Sarge, Chris Hunter Actual, Mickey S, Oki. We have USMC here. And we have a lot of guests who we know from the dis various Discord servers. I'd like to start by talking about, well, what is emergency management? What's this all about? Why are we doing this? Well, we've heard varying opinions over several months and several years from different folks about what's the point of this, right? Well, mindset, basically, that's never going to happen to me. That won't happen here. Uh, we really want to try to help everybody move away from that mindset of this can never happen here. If history has ever taught us a valuable lesson, it is that if something bad has happened in the past, it is very likely that that type of incident can take place in the future. We are going to touch on the very basics tonight in our introduction to a multi-series uh, multi, uh, uh, podcast on urban survival and wilderness survival, emergency planning and management, preparation, survival skills. So I'd like to open with a statement that the actions taken in the initial minutes of an emergency are critical. A prompt warning to family and household members or loved ones or members of your party to either evacuate or shelter in place or lock down the residents can save lives. This is when we're down to minutes count and seconds count and there is time is in short supply. Being prepared is not simply having completed a checklist of items needed to survive. Um, emergency management and survival skills. This is not about um, you know, run-of-the-mill list of things to go get at Costco or Sam's Club. 
although that doesn't hurt to, you know, have an emergency supply of food and water, medications and first aid, survival gear, um, extra clothing, alternative power sources, alternative lighting, batteries, um, you know, fire making, uh, cooking, um, you know, cooking utensils, paper plates, all that, all that stuff. We can run down a run down a list of that a little bit later. But um, everybody should really have a plan of action. You should have a checklist of those items. Um, so being prepared for an emergency, whether it's a natural natural disaster or a man-made incident such as uh, civil unrest or rioting, um, hurricanes, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, that sort of thing. Um, usually we're gonna have some sort of advance notice for that, for those types of things. We'll always basically get a heads up that a hurricane's scheduled to make landfall in X amount of days and you're either going to make a decision to get out of its way or you're going to lock down shelter in place and ride the storm out. So in our opinion, being prepared requires forming plans, a plan A, a backup plan B, a plan, another backup plan C, yet another one, plan D, and so on and so forth. Being prepared requires a willingness to act. It requires a strong mental mindset to always remain calm, even in the face of great adversity. In the United States Marine Corps and the U.S. military motto in general is to improvise and adapt and overcome. Emergencies and other dangerous situations can arise with notice or without warning. Circumstances with advance notice and warning are usually easy to prepare for. Natural disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, blizzards, even volcanic activity, wildfires, some man-made situations such as planned marches and demonstrations, protests and civil disobedience can usually be avoided with um, a little bit of advance notice. We are going to be looking to um, also talk about what, what other types of situations can occur um, with very minimal notice. Okay. There are usually situations, emergency situations, which will arise with absolutely very little warning or no warning whatsoever. So. <clears throat> Pardon me. In a perfect world, nothing would ever go wrong. And even if something were to take place, most, if not all of us, would be given the benefit of advance notice and warning. So a classic example of this advance notice and warning would be the National Weather Service tracking the tropical storm, the hurricane, like I mentioned, scheduled to make landfall in X amount of days, a winter storm with blizzard conditions. Uh, those types of situations most or all of us have either seen on television or we've uh, seen people in stores making uh, preparations to either evacuate the area or the region or lock it down, shelter in place. We've all witnessed the folks heading into the grocery store for food and water and medications and whatnot. We've seen folks at the gas stations filling up their vehicles, filling up gas cans. Finally, we've seen the folks at the home improvement stores buying generators and snow removal equipment and salt, sand, tools, plywood, duct tape, plastic sheeting, et cetera. Well, that's all, that's all fine when there's some sort of advance notice. People usually take action when they see some sort of, some sort of an official notice. However, let's, we really want to focus on without warning absolutely no warning whatsoever in many nations around the world and in the united states particularly modern technology and modern conveniences have given most if not all of us a very very false sense of security uh, some really truly hold that belief that well you know 
hey, you a son, hey, hippo, hey, docs, you know, that that's not going to happen here. It won't happen to us, not to me, not to my family. And again, you know, history repeats itself. So planning ahead is definitely something that you really want to consider. So I was just going to throw out a hypo- hypothetical question to all of our guests and our listeners, which is, um, let's say, let's say you just arrived home from work after a 12 hour shift and you're just tired. You're dead tired. You just settled down, took your boots off. You're about to have dinner without any warning at all. The power goes out. You don't have a clue when that power is coming back on. You don't know if that power could be off for days, weeks, months. Well, the question is how many folks listening are truly prepared to take care of ourselves and our families in some type of an event like that where there's absolutely no warning whatsoever. The United States has a highly antiquated power grid, which is absolutely susceptible to attack, outside attack, and even um, natural causes such as solar flares. Um, Someone with mad skills and very nefarious intentions could disrupt the nation's power grid through the computers. Well, mm-hmm. that power goes out. Now what? Now you have a family. You have children. You might have infant children. You have wives and husbands who may be ill or injured. You might have elderly parents living with you. You're not going out to find fuel. You're not going to find much food. The shelves are already going to be picked over within minutes. Gas stations closed. You're not getting money out of the ATMs. You're not have. You're not getting access to prescription medications, which are going to be vital for some people. You're not going to find medical supplies. So, and within one or two days following a regional or national power outage, you can bet that the water from your faucet your kitchen tap is not going to be safe for consumption. The water treatment facilities need tons of electricity to keep the water safe for human consumption. So I'd like to to talk with uh, Docs here for a second and I'd like to ask you, Docs, can you uh, tell us where folks can find water in an absolute emergency without warning? Right, right around their home or inside their home. Well, there's multiple ways to do that. Um, first off, I would say that everybody should have water stockpiled anyway. You know, whether it be just a couple of cases of bottled water, or gallons of water, but if you need emergency water around your home itself. As unpleasant as it sounds, you have water heaters, you have toilets, you have back caches, you have filter lines in the back of your refrigerator and your ice maker. Um, There's numerous sources of water available. And so, say water from the toilet tank or from the water heater tank. Um... Would most people be able to purify it at to a level where it's uh, safe for consumption? Uh, you can do it with household bleach um, that has no added chemicals, like um, color safe bleaches are no good, scented bleaches are no good, but your standard bleaches, 10%, 8 and a quarter percent, or 6% bleach can be used to treat water. Iodine can be used to treat water, water purification tablets, boiling over sterno or a camp stove or a grill, um, many different ways. Thank you. So what is like the rule of thumb for for non-scented chlorine bleach, um, basically four drops per gallon if it's at 10% and at eight and a quarter percent concentration on the bleach, you want to go with about six drops. And when um, you got to just make sure you guys check the label on the on the bottle, 
a 6% concentration of bleach, you will probably want to go with about eight drops. And then obviously if you're drawing water from a swimming pool, uh, that can also be uh, purified for consumption. But if that water is extremely cold or murky or cloudy, um, docks, you, you say that would, it would be probably your best, your best bet to um, double the amounts on the chlorine bleach. Yeah, if it's cloudy, murky, um, cold water, it needs to have double the amount and as far as swimming pools. Um, if it's just after an emergency, you don't need to purify it. It's already purified because of the chlorine treatment. Um, it's usually the standard sw swimming pool is at two parts per million of chlorine, and you can test that with a pH strip. Um, anybody who has a pool should have pH strips on hand anyway, so it shouldn't be an issue to test it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, would any, uh, Chris or uh, Hippo, anybody like to talk about the uh, three-second rule or the, uh, the rule of three? I, I added the three-second rule for use of deadly force. That's just something from my background training. Hey, but before before you move on, <clears throat> uh, as far as water, if you get in a jam, one thing I want to throw out there is you could take a, a standard – plastic uh you know whether it's a shopping bag or a, a trash bag and wrap it around any type of green leafy bushes or uh tree tree limbs with leaves on it and you'll collect water that way as well great one dart excellent thank you so the uh the rule of 3 one of the sort of touch on this and like i said i added in the three second rule for use of force likely to cause death or great bodily harm to defend yourself defend your families in such an event absolute last resort but that's about the amount of time that you're going to have to make a decision and actually to follow through and the consequences of you failing to follow through if you are going to own or keep firearms, it is absolutely vital that you practice how you play practice often. And this is strictly in self-defense or defense of your family members in your household. Um, but I'd like to ask uh, Hippocampus or uh, Chris Hunter, if you want, because if folks want to touch on the, the rule of three on the other issues, please. Sure. One of the things I wanted to say real quick is that uh, you want to also shut off your water valves to your house as soon as possible. Uh, that'll help to stop contaminations getting into your house. Um, the rule of threes uh, kind of go by um, like three minutes without oxygen to survive, uh, three hours without shelter, um, Three days without water, three weeks without food. That's a long time, I'm going to say. Just say that. <laughs> uh, but uh, kind of want to keep some of those things in mind uh, and that kind of a priority when you're in that situation to take care of those things the sooner the better in, in that sequence. Thank you. And... Um... I mean, on that subject, on the subject of oxygen, we see, we see uh, many of us see on the television or on the internet news, we see these organizations like Antifa, and they are wearing gas masks, which almost look like they're um, law enforcement grade, possibly even military grade, to stop tear gas from authorities well if there were a if there were an attack on our environment by a terror organization and let's say anthrax was introduced or some other sort of toxin mustard gas or sarin were introduced um you know you everybody's going to be in for a really really bad day uh, because some of that stuff is odorless, it's colorless. And if, there, if an alert goes out that 
uh, that the air has been contaminated, it would probably be hoove you to uh, have some gas masks for yourself and for your family members. And um, can anybody, docs or uh, some, uh, maybe USMC, Sarge, can you guys touch on the type of gas mask filtration system that would probably be necessary to withstand a uh, poison attack on the environment? Oh, wow, you just gave me a very long, long task. Um, uh, <laughs> Huge. So let me put it this way. If you don't already own a mask, you're behind the curve. If you can go to a hardware store and get a just a painter's mask, they've got some that have pretty good grades on them. It'll stop some pretty heavy particulates and stuff like that, but it's not going to stop mustard gas. I mean, uh, I would like to go back to your original question, if I could. Absolutely. You said, what would I do if all of the sudden the power goes out? First, I would look at my cell phone to see if it too went out. If not, I'd call the power company and stay put. Lights going out doesn't mean, oh my God, time to go and, you know, purge. It, it means stay calm and, and, you know, investigate. Absolutely. And uh, I, I, I'd also say if if the power does go out and your cell phone goes out and you're looking around going, crap, even my backup battery stuff is dead, what happened? At that point, either nature or man did something to cause that to happen. Best bet, get to some kind of an authority. Don't don't think it's a video game. Don't go out there trying to go loot. We've survived worse things because humans pull together, and I think that needs to be the base of what this is. How do you help each other? You know, and, and the prepping and stuff, we need to keep it simple. Go out and, and buy a pair of shoes that you can actually walk in. If you don't have your car, when's the last time you've walked two miles? Can you? Buy a baby stroller so you can carry a few things instead of wearing it on your back. You know, those are the survival tips that I think people really need to hear. Absolutely, thanks, Sarge. Yeah, we're definitely gonna we're definitely gonna get into that in um, in the um, before the hour segment is up. Um, I was just wondering about the, the gas masks, like the regular, the regular gas masks that people can order online, uh, like mine. You know, I still have mine with several cartridges that are rated for nuclear, biological, and chemical. And, you know, I mean, something beneath that, would, would that be sufficient for most of the folks out there for themselves and, and their family members? I, I put my wife and children's life to value enough to get military grade. The best they could get is buy something online and, and buy the best one that they can offer. I, I, I don't know what their needs are. But in a pinch, you can still use things, you know, like masks for, for painting and stuff. I don't know all the biological, nuclear biological and chemical standards for, for mass protection, but... May I cut in here? If you're considering a biological response, even uh, a painter suit, uh, duct tape, uh, some eyeglass wear, uh, for breathing the stuff, you got to have some masks. You got to make sure that there are refill canisters that you can get more masks for. Um, you need to consider children's sizes as well if you've got. Small children, the adult sizes do not fit their heads. There will not be a uh, good stoppage of any biologicals going in there. I agree. And, yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
what hippocampus just touched on and what sarge just touched on um i i think about you know i think about america how much i love this country how much we love america and think about the folks out there and i spent more than half my life looking out for the folks and doing the best that i could um but I, I think about the things that we as Americans will basically spend money on, like, you know, spend quite a bit of money on a, a, a 70 inch flat screen, you know, uh, one of those really fancy uh, you know, uh, 4,000 pixel uh, type TVs, or we'll spend a lot of money to go on vacation where we'll spend that extra money to get, you know, the really top of the line automobile or what have you. We'll spend that money on dining out, but, um, you know, something like that for, you know, consider spending that money and, and getting the best possible gas masks that you can get with the canisters rated for nuclear, biological and chemical. Um, we're not saying, at all, we are not saying that something is going to happen. We're saying that something can possibly happen. That means anything can possibly happen. So, you know, absolutely the ability to breathe air is vital. That That is an absolute given. Everyone knows that. But you basically have about three minutes. You know, whether you're underwater or you're trying to hold your breath and stop toxins from coming in, you have about three minutes and your children might have less than three minutes and elders in the home might have less than that. So, you know, there's other, you know, besides gas masks, you might want to consider having a couple rolls of uh, good rolls of duct tape, you know, some plastic sheeting. Maybe you could cover up your windows, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, but I wanted to move on to the next, uh, next subject on the rule of three. The three hours without shelter, and uh, so basically, the necessity to protect your body from extreme cold and rain, snow, ice, wind, high winds, extreme heat is vital to survival. And three hours is approximately the standard maximum amount of time a human being may have before hypothermia or heat stroke set in, depending on what part of the world you're in, what part of America you're in, uh, what type, well, you know, what season it is. So uh, would any of the core group like to touch on um, shelter? That's going to be your basic necessity besides f fire and then water. Shelter first. Find water. Make fire. Do I have those in the wrong order? Anyone? No, that's going to depend. If you just came out of a freezing cold river, you're going to want fire before you want shelter. Um, the rule of three hours without shelter is kind of for extreme situations. For instance, if you're in the middle of winter in the in the northern states, you know, there's snow on the ground, you're going to need shelter within about three hours. Um, most areas, when an emergency happens and you have no warning, shelter is sometimes a key component, sometimes not. Sometimes fire is enough, depending on, you know, what the situation is. But the reason for stating shelter is you need to keep your core body temperature at 98.6 degrees. If it goes five degrees in either direction, you can die. It's really that simple. So the, the order of shelter is more about preserving your core body temperature than it is anything else. You know, you don't want to lose body heat. You don't want to gain too much body heat. So if you look at it in that aspect, it gives you a little bit of a more clear picture on what the shelter means. I, 
Uh, thank you, Docs. I was going to um, just touch on touch on water uh, just one more time since we're working our way down the rule of three. Approximately three days without water might be a little bit subjective depending on the individual. Um, if you have you have someone uh, who's elderly or someone who's sick or uh, someone who's on you know a bunch of medications that are going to rapidly cause dehydration, um, that three day rule without water could be a little bit subjective. So um, you know folks you wanna really consider just stockpiling water. Um, you want to, the rule of thumb, you want to have about two gallons per person per day. Um, you know, a gallon minimum for consumption, a gallon for um, hygiene, or even for maybe cooking. You know, if you want to boil, you know, make some rice or uh, what have you, but two gallons per day per person. So obviously, you know, if you have a family of five and who knows, you know, you don't know. You want to you want to keep uh, about a ten day supply of water for every member of your family. So, and then uh, I did want to touch on what Docs was saying a little while ago. You know, about I mean, Docs, you said household pets, your dogs and cats. You know, obviously they can just go drink wherever they can go drink out of a river, or a little stream, or a creek, or what have you, but. Um, docs can, in theory, can you go and take water out of out of a pond that has a layer of scum on top of the water? Can you move? Can you move that? Can you? Yes. Um, in an urban environment, I wouldn't recommend it. The best thing you can do is the can I like uh, with that stick, please? Uh, Go dart. You can collect condom. Like, uh, you know, uh, whatever to uh, focus the condom receptacle, so filling uh, purifies into a into a different container. Does that make sense? Boiling a big pot of water with a glass top on it you have the glass top slid over to another receptacle so it's focusing the condensation that the steam is producing and puts it into another receptacle and that purifies the water uh, in 99.9% .9 of cases well yes and no it, it really depends on what kind of chemical components might be in that water in an urban environment from pesticides and everything else getting that out of the water isn't as easy as distillation in a lot of cases. So once again, um, you know, if you've got an extremely, you know, if you have no other choice, by all means, if you've got a moss covered pond in the middle of your neighborhood or whatnot, feasibly, yes, you could do it, but depending on what's in it, you may need a triple distillation, depending on what kind of chemicals have been leached into that water source. Um, by all means, running water is always going to be better than still water, but if you have no other choice, then, you know. In today's society, with all of the vehicles and all of the lawn sprays and all of the bug killers, all of that stuff gets leached off into our standing water sources that are in urban areas. So that really needs to be a consideration. Yeah, that's true. That is very good information from you guys. Thank you. And in coming podcasts, we're going to uh, be breaking down these segments um, into uh, specific um, specialized instruction on how to properly locate water, which you can um, put through a process to purify it, stabilize it, um, maybe you know, even distill it and properly store it. Um, we, we could probably spend 
you know, at least a couple hours talking about, you know, how to, uh, how folks can find water and in, uh, in an absolute emergency dire situation. Uh, so we are definitely going to be uh, touching on that in uh, coming podcasts. Um, I wanted to move on and talk about, about food, you know, absolutely following a, a disaster, whether it's natural or, you know, a terror attack or uh, any, any type of activity which may cause long-term power outages that are going to last for days or even weeks, you know, you want to stay away, absolutely stay away from stocking your freezer up with um, meats and poultry and, you know, that sort of thing that's going to thaw out. And that, uh, once again, in future podcasts, we are going to spend a considerable amount of time on um, discussing uh, food preservation and storage. But, um, you know, I would like to ask uh, Hippocampus if you would please touch on some uh, some ideas that folks could have for uh, for food for emergencies. Well, that's uh, really simple. Uh, if anybody wanted to do canning or even drying out fruits, um, the best route I would have to say is the Indian way and make pemmican uh, for emergencies. It's the best for <clears throat> extra oomph that you're going to need in times of an emergency. And it's very nutritious and it tastes good. But canning, preservation, jerky making, <laughs> yeah, there's there's lots to do for storage-wise. Um, we could do a whole show on that for sure. Uh, stocking up the pantry, though, yeah, we could do that for most people within three to six months for emergencies. Thank you. Yeah, you know, a subject like that, I... I I've had conversations with um, many people on the subject of stockpiling food and uh, medications and whatnot. And the one thing that I keep hearing time after time is the uh, cost prohibitiveness uh, where, you know, many, many Americans and probably many folks around the world that may be listening are on fixed income or they're on a, they're on a tight budget, and that's uh, definitely something that we're going to want to spend a considerable amount of time talking about. Um, you know, canning and, and uh, drying of drying of foods, uh, freeze drying foods, and proper storage. You know, I mean, but just like for quick reference, if you if you were to go every time you go to the grocery store, you know, you know, just grab grab an extra you know, bag of rice, um, you know, stay away, stay away from the, uh, most, you know, canned goods and absolutely stay away from perishable items. Um, you want to avoid sodas and, you know, stuff like that. All it's going to do is, um, cause that can cause some dehydration, but, um, Go for the dry mixes, you know, your, your cereals and grains, your oatmeal, you know, instant oatmeal packets are pretty helpful in a pinch. Absolutely uh, rice, you know, and if you are going to go for uh, canned foods, you know, you want, you want tinned foods, tuna fish, you know, stuff that, you know, stuff like that. But tuna, you know, something to keep in mind, this is something Doc's told me just yesterday that uh, calories matter more than protein more than carbohydrates it's absolutely about calories and how many calories per day does each individual burn well that's absolutely subjective based on your level of activity if you're if you're stagnant if, if you're just uh sitting still often you know it's going to be much different than uh, if you're doing uh, labor intensive things like you know chopping firewood or even carrying uh, carrying equipment or uh, you know even patrolling an area with a with a rifle with ammunition and whatnot and other equipment so yeah you're gonna burn through calories and uh, another thing that we want to 
sort of get on a get people on a mindset of just because it's a few extra dollars well it, you know sure you you, you want to spend 30 extra dollars each time you go to the grocery store well in a matter of two or three days people go and spend that type of money at a starbucks you know getting uh, some sort of uh, you know fancy hot drink or cough cold coffee iced coffee or whatnot you know they're spending four or five six dollars at a pop you know to walk in there and I, you know i'm not just singling out starbucks but you know any place that spe- has specialty drinks so you know we do we do want to consider uh, you know our, our priorities financially um, especially you know when you have a family counting on you and you have children counting on you and they're going to be hungry and they're going to be looking to you you know that's something you know you don't want to be caught in a situation where you're unable to find food and now you're you know you're really going to be sort of kicking yourself and kicking yourself and regretting um, not stocking up so you know so you know on the basics the basics as far as um, whether you're going to stay at home and lock down you know that's again that's something that we're going to go into great detail about um, things that you may want to consider doing to your residents and the type of supplies and equipment and the type of knowledge that you might want to have and the type of planning that you might want to have. Um, if it's an event such as a power outage, even at that lasts for five days. And let's say you're, you're away from a large city or, you know, a major population center. Um, yeah, you're still gonna, you're still gonna want to make sure that you have the, have those items with, uh, food, water, medications, you know, first aid, all that type of equipment. But again, we're going to, we're going to be touching on that in future podcasts about, um, whether you're going to stay home, uh, whether you're going to shelter in place, whether you're going to, um, grab the go bags and, uh, I mean, yet that right there, the go bags, the bug out bags, um, something I learned recently about bug out bags, ounces are pounds and pounds equal pain. Um, so yeah, suppose you take your family and there's five bug out bags loaded with all types of stuff and those bags are heavy and you break down your vehicle runs out of fuel or the engine stops or there's um, some sort of a blockage on a road and you can't get by or the roads are all clogged up and now you are resorting to going on foot. So you want to, I mean, that's, that's a subject that we're going to go into considerable detail and considerable amount of time on bug out bags and how to best um, keep the weight to an absolute minimum. And then, um, pardon me, the next, uh, next subject that I'd like to talk about, and I have a particular interest in this, is alternative destination. In the event of widespread chaos, civil disobedience, demonstrations, the imposition of martial law, rioting, um, looting, Folks residing in major cities, large population centers with, uh, say, population of over, you know, 200,000 or up, you need to strongly consider some sort of an alternative destination to take yourself and your family away from the city, away from that large population center as quickly and as quietly as possible. Um, leaving your residence leaving your home behind is an absolutely a major decision, which requires considerable factors and variables when you're planning. This is something that folks should really, really take, take this to heart. What I'm about to say about alternative destinations. And the reason I'm touching on this a little heavy is because in the United States, I would say a great a great majority of the residents of the United States reside in major cities 
large population centers. You have folks, again, I'm going to touch on this. You have folks who have elderly parents or grandparents living with them. You have folks that have infant children or toddlers. Um, some folks have many children. Some have, you know, five, five kids. Um, yeah, I mean, that's another question I'd like to pose to anyone in the, in the core group, you know, that, you know, how many people right now at this very moment within say five to 10 minutes are prepared to take your family and evacuate your residence? I mean, just in a matter of minutes, grab your bags, have all of your family or your party accounted for, get in the vehicles and go. Uh, does anybody want to have an answer for, for that? Twelve minutes. Twelve. Okay. Okay. Twelve minutes is what it would take for my entire family to be in a vehicle and moving. Practice, practice, practice. Absolutely. You know, I want to remind everyone that we are not promoting fear. We're not fear mongering. We are caring about our fellow Americans. We're caring about the, uh, the elders out there and the women, the children, people with disabilities, people with illnesses. You know, we're, we're thinking about the folks and bad things seem to always happen to good people. And I will repeat that bad things happen to good people all the time. And I have witnessed that firsthand many times. Um, but does anybody, would anybody like to guess how many people, how many households within the United States are percentage wise are prepared to leave in a matter of 12 to 20 minutes or even prepared to leave in one hour? That's one thing that most need to discover if they were to leave, where to go. And so people need to pull out a map. People need to discover their regions and their state borders and the county lines and uh, see where the routes can take them, see where the possibilities of roadblocks could be and uh, divert. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Great information. Can I jump in here for a second? Certainly. As far as leaving your home, you know, there, I'm, I'm not ever going to promote that somebody should just up and leave their home without having an understanding of exactly what's going on or what's asking, what's causing them to leave their home. But the facts are going to remain the same that, and as much as I wanted to stay away from politics during this course, I have to use recent events in politics as an example. Most of the um, financially challenged and unprepared people in the United States currently live within major uh, metropolises, LA, New York, Dallas, major cities. Back when all of the Antifa protests were going really strong, you didn't hear about him hitting Sweetwater, Texas. You heard about him going in L.A., Portland, you know, Seattle, major cities. If anything bad were to happen, most of the drama is going to happen in major cities before it happens, you know, in rural areas. As far as where to go, to be honest, you can go to a storage facility out in Hooterville. For any of those that don't know Hooterville, it's Petticoat Junction. But, you know, out in the middle of, you know, a rural area, you can go to a national park or a national forest if you have those skills. You can go to a family member that lives in the country. You can find networks of people, you know, that you can 
team up with that are in a rural area to buy yourself time. You don't necessarily have to go buy a 120 acre homestead because you may not be financially able to do that. But having some place to go is, you know, subjective to the level of comfort that you expect to achieve. But getting out of the city is the important aspect of that because that's where all the drama is going to unfold first. Thank you, Docs. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I have written several pages on the subject of alternative destination planning factors, considerations, um, and how things can rapidly change. And so I had posed that question that of how many folks are truly prepared to take their family, evacuate their home, and head for the hills, for lack of a better phrase. The answer is 1%. There's two types of people in the United States and around the world. There are the 99 percenters who are not prepared. I am not completely prepared to do something like that. Um, most people, you know, I, I I'm, will admit that right now, that I am not. 100% prepared to move my family. I have, uh, you know, special circumstances. I have uh, parents who are not well. Uh, I have a mother who's on oxygen. Um, yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of factors to consider, you know, when you're making a decision to evacuate your home. You know, your home is your castle. It's your fortress. And like docs and others with military, you know, people, we have other members that have military backgrounds and law enforcement backgrounds. And this is an absolute fact that no fortress, no wall, no vault anywhere on earth in the history of human civilization has been able to withstand a sustained external attack. Now, keeping in mind, keeping in mind that if your home comes under attack from four sides, and it's just you as the dad and your wife as the mom, and let's say you you are armed, even with a rifle or a shotgun or you know pepper spray or what have you, you will be overrun. Um, you know if if the world were to basically go to hell real quickly. People searching for food and searching for, uh, oh, it's not, not just food. People are going to become desperate. And when people are desperate, they will do things that they would never have done. And this includes possibly even other family members, neighbors, coworkers, friends, people that you've known for years, they're going to panic. They're going to look for food. They're going to look for medications. There are people who take prescribed medications for pain, who, um, whether they know this or not, they are dependent on those medications. You, su you suddenly stop taking your prescribed medications and you could suffer major physiological um, effects. There are people out there and we are not judging anyone, but there are people out there with addictions to other types of drugs, heroin and cocaine and um, methyl, you know, crystal meth and uh, whatnot. Um, there are, you know, so there's a lot of factors. And I mean, we're certainly not condoning that people stockpile those types of items, but you know, to each his own, it's all subjective. But when you're talking about trying to defend your home, these are some of the things that you might want to really truly consider. You know, you could have an absolute arsenal of weapons. And if you are by yourself and your home is being attacked from four sides, you will get, you will get overrun. So uh, like Docs was saying it is, probably absolutely the best bet to, uh, you know, if conditions warrant, um, get your folks together and 
get away as quickly as possible. So, but I want to touch on that alternative destination a little bit more. You know, suppose you've received some sort of notice of some type of an event. You gather your family and your loved ones, you grab your go bags, you get in your vehicle, you depart the area, you get your family away from major cities. Well, next question is then what? Now you're, now you're out somewhere. And if you don't have a plan of action or a backup plan, you know, you're going to run into factors such as not having really anywhere to go. Hotels and motels with no vacancies. Um, you can't uh, locate a relative's house because, you know, none of us really write addresses down anymore on paper. Everything is electronic. And when the electronics go with the power, now we've lost our ability to reach people or even know somebody's phone number because we're, you know, it's happened to me where I, I you know, I, I do keep a list of names, addresses, phone numbers, you know, just for exactly for that reason. The last time my phone broke on me and all of my contacts were, you know, I had no access to it. So I decided to write out a list of everybody that I know and addresses and, you know, that's really what's most important, not even phone numbers, but, you know, house addresses. But anyway, you're out, you got your family, you're out in the middle of nowhere, and you run into those factors, no vacancies anywhere, campgrounds don't have um, any sites available, um, you can't locate anybody, you know, then that question comes up again, then what? You know, you've gotten yourself, you've gotten your family, your loved ones out of the immediate danger, but without a plan, you've now just taken your family and placed them into another dangerous set of circumstances. You have now discovered there's nowhere for you and your loved ones to go, to eat, to sleep, to bathe. Um, family members who may need uh, have special needs, such as infant children, elders, uh, people who are disabled or ill, people on oxygen. You know, there's so many considerations that you, you want to uh, take into account. You've discovered or you've discovered the location that you've arrived at is an absolute threat. Um, there's no electrical power there at all. There's no food available. The gas stations can't, you can't pump gas. You can't get prescription medications. Question, then what? There's a multitude of considerations that you need to factor in when planning to evacuate your family from your residence and go to an alternative location. So, yeah, again, I'll say that simply getting your family away from the immediate danger is only one part of the battle. Um, so the question, are you properly prepared? Do you have the proper food and water and medical uh, you know, prescription medications. Do you have the ability to keep diabetic medications stored properly and kept cold? Do you have first aid? Do you have additional fuel? Do you have the ability to create fire? Do you have cooking um, utensils and pots and pans? Do you have lighting and alternative power and tools? Do you have maps? Do you have waterproof maps, paper maps? Do you have communications, any type of two-way radios? Do you have a emergency radio, uh, either by battery or one of those uh, hand crank radios, where you can get some sort of information about what's going on in the world around you? And then, you know, are you prepared to defend your family? Do you have the proper weapons? Do you have the, enough ammunition? Do you have a knife? Do you have pepper spray? Do you have a fire extinguisher in case some a fire gets out of hand? or your vehicle is now on fire and you need to get that fire out immediately? Do you have camping gear and clothing for cold weather, survival, shoes and boots, toiletry items? I mean, there's just so many factors that you need to consider. Next thing, uh, this is a really, truly important subject. Um, without warning, absolutely no warning. Communication goes out along with the power. We lose the internet. We lose the cell phones. We lose all electricity. 
no problem. Absolutely not a problem. You simply remain calm and you know that you're trained for this. You're trained for this. You train for this. Your spouse trained for it. Your children, your loved ones are all trained. You all planned ahead for these types of circumstances. You and your family and your household members or friends or uh, any member of your party have formed a plan of action to link up, uh, regroup, rendezvous, whatever you'd like to call it. They're all fancy names. Get together, get back together with your people. Go to, you know, if you have a plan of where to meet, you know, none of your family, nobody's going to panic. You all know what to do. You know what to do because you've repeatedly worked on this. You have repeatedly worked on this. If you have a teenage daughter or a teenage son, you know, they, they need to understand that <clears throat> when the time comes, they are going to need to stand on their own two feet. And this is where a little bit of self-reliance is going to come into play to stay calm and stay composed. And you want to have pre-selected meeting locations. All right. Plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. All right. So if you get to a pre-planned rendezvous point and it is not compromised and it's safe then what you know you don't wait around for 10 minutes and if nobody shows up you move to the next place now you sit still sit still and if somebody needs to go check the other location you send one person or two at the, at the most but keep everybody together get your family back together you know good communication is absolutely vital you know, letting loved ones know where each other are at is vital to successful regrouping. This is the vital, absolute vital first step of any and all emergency planning for survival in the event of any type of situation where communications are lost. This is the absolute number one thing you need to plan for with your loved ones. Take the time to study the areas which are safe to meet again you know buy some paper maps write down names and addresses write out your plan a b c d you need backup plans make copies of this information you know put or, or write them out on index cards for quick reference but you want to have copies of your of your emergency plan inside of your bug out bags and if you have you know teenage children that are venturing out you know probably wouldn't hurt for them to carry, you know, one of the, a quick reference card. Um, so proceed to your rally point. If it's safe, stay put. When your family's regrouped, move on to the next step. So um, um, Sarge or uh, anybody want to talk about um, alternative communications? There's always a uh, written light sound smoke um it's different places you can leave messages for people set designated areas <clears throat> those are things i would recommend in case you're separated we we had seen a great example of of what Chris Hunter had just talked about on September 11th, 2001 in New York City. We literally seen thousands of people writing out messages and notes and placing them up to try to reestablish contact with their loved ones. That's uh, actually a really good idea and thank you for adding that in there. And Again, um, in coming podcasts, we are going to spend a considerable amount of time talking about emergency management and planning for 
uh, evacuating your home and um, heading for an alternative location. Um, again, back to the back to the information. So communications, intelligence, logistics, you know, these are things that you really want to go over and take, take some time, you know, don't watch a sitcom or don't want, you know, don't, don't, you know, in the amount of time that you could watch the mainstream media feed you, God knows what type of information or misinformation you could really get a lot done. Just sit down and do a little research do some planning, get some ideas, talk about it with your family, talk about it with your wife or your husband, your children, um, you know, maybe even talk about it at the dinner table about, Hey, what do we do if this happens? And if that happens, then what, then what, you know, get that conversation started. And also I want to go into the uh, issue of having a handwritten or computer printed emergency plans all right basically the who what where when type um set up you know the members of your family need to all have access to that information the emergency plans the members of your group you want to be able to have contact information again uh, where where to go where to find them you know so um some some folks, I mean, I'm guilty of this myself. Where before I re- wrote everything down, you know, you know, if I had a friend living in Michigan, and I had a general idea of where my friend and his wife lived, but didn't know for sure. So you know, calling that's not an option, and you're not emailing, you're not texting. So that's all gone. That's all gone. So you really want to consider you know, having those addresses written down, you know, you want to talk about what, what is the emergency plan? You know, hey, USN. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I know there's still quite a bit of stuff to cover, but it is eight ten. So just be aware of your, your time frame there, sir. Gotcha. Thank you. All right, well, I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. Who, what, where, when, why, how, all that stuff. You know, we're going to cover that extensively in coming podcasts. Um, you know, what are the emergency plans, the plans for the variables, you know, where, you know, stay put, lock down, evacuate. If so, to where, then what? You know, these are this is the mindset that you want to get in is, keep asking yourself then what each time ask yourself what is the next step and if that goes wrong what is an alternative so you know you could spend a considerable considerable amount of time working on emergency planning especially for evacuating your home having a reasonable amount of time to lock your home down and stay put or reasonable amount of time to head out of town you need to consider a lot of things so, such as, um, you know, like Doc had said, 12 minutes, he could have his family in the vehicle and heading out of town. Okay. You know, if we could all, if we could all be that fast, you know, we would all be in really good shape. And that requires a lot of preparation and a lot of training. Um, so I'm going to go into a closing here. Somebody's got an open microphone, but that's okay. Um, basically, those of us who are prepared, to, people who are prepared, people who have planned ahead, you absolutely hold a major tactical and strategic advantage over all others who have failed to prepare and failed to act. So you know, always, always want to keep in mind why you're doing this. Remember when the world goes to hell, when norms are gone, when widespread panic takes hold, those members of your family, your loved ones, your children, your spouse, they're all going to be looking to you. People are going to be depending on you, counting on you, looking to you for answers and for guidance, looking to you for leadership. 
This is not a time for you to panic because you didn't prepare. You're not going to come apart. You've planned for this. You've trained for this. You must and you will lead from the front. You will not show fear or your family will lose all hope. You will take charge. Someone in the household must step up and take a leadership role. You have to lead by example, by remaining calm and giving clear directives. You're not to be asking for people to do things. You're telling them to do things. You're not waiting. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're not going to be waiting on others who are wasting precious time gathering unnecessary, unneeded items such as wants. No. You get the things you need and you go. You're going to lead your family and your party to safety. You're not going to want to delay while others in your family or your party create indecision, uncertainty, doubt, or drama or hysteria. None of those things are going to be helpful, obviously. You will rise up to the occasion, and you will lead with strength, and, and you will lead with confidence. And how is it that we can be so sure that everybody listening will be able to do this? We know this because you're here with us tonight. You're here tonight. You'll be here with us each Monday night where we will do our level best to advise and teach and guide you all to forming yourselves into strong, confident leaders, leaders of the people who are counting on you, depending on you. Those children, people with disabilities, people that are sick, they're counting on you, they're depending on you. All of you are important to us. We have every faith that you will take this knowledge seriously. We will walk through the fire with you, with the training and the proper knowledge. And if you're armed with a plan of action, you absolutely will rise to the occasion. If you do not have the training, the knowledge, and you are not armed with a plan of action, you will not rise up. You will fall back down to the lowest level, the last level you had. So failure to plan is an absolute plan for failure. I'll say that again. Failing to plan is planning to fail. So don't do that. Have a plan. Do the training. Do the research. Spend the extra money. Make it happen. Protect your families. Rise up and lead from the front for your God and country, for your love of your family, for all the things dear to your hearts. Practice how you play. Take this subject very serious. Because in the moment of truth, when panic sets in, nothing, and I absolutely mean this, nothing will be more important than you being prepared to win. So thank you, folks. Please come back and join us next Monday where we are going to start getting into um, highly detailed subjects on our podcasts. Um, and no, these are not in a particular order, but, uh, you know, we're definitely going to spend a considerable amount of time uh, on uh, locating water filtration, stabilization, distilling, proper storage. Uh, we're going to get into food storage, dating, inventory management, drying, uh, freeze drying, canning. Uh, we're going to have a considerable amount of time spent even on something like vehicle maintenance, making sure that your vehicles are ready to go at all times. Don't, uh, you don't want to keep three uh, quarter tank of gas in there. You keep your gas tanks filled up, keep your gas cans filled up. Don't wait until the weekend to fill those up. You might need them for your generator. Um, we're going to have segments on alternative power and lighting systems, emergency heating. We're going to get into building and residential security. We're going to get into weapons for defense of people as a last resort. We're going to talk about weapons maintenance. We're going to talk about outdoor survival and safety. We're going to have detailed segments on fire making, surviving in the wilderness, surviving in the mountains, surviving in winter conditions, surviving in desert heat, 
We're going to have segments on hunting and fishing and gathering, shooting skills, emergency micro caches. We're going to get into gridding and mapping, tracking, plotting, all, all sorts of fun subjects that we hope will help everyone be safe if and when an emergency occurs here in the United States or any other part of the world. Uh, with that, I want to say thank you and um, God bless you all and God bless America and Hippo, it's all yours, ma'am. Thank you. USN, you're a blast. Go, Dart. What you got? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, thanks for the information. I, I posted the Air Force SEER guide, which goes over a lot of the same information in PDF format in the channel above. Super duper. Thank you. USN, would you just mind dropping the uh, next week's topic subject, please? Okay, sure. How does the core group feel about having uh, the subject be location, filtration, stabilization, and storage of water? Let's not ask, let's just do. All right, let's go with that. Super next duper. Week. Next week, we'll be talking about water filtration storage situations. I thank you all for your ear. USN, you've been fabulous. Docs, I appreciate all your input. Sarge, you're wonderful. All your ears, all your patriot hearts have been so welcomed here. And please come back and join us next week. Have a great night. Be well and kick ass. I think the old uh, microphone being off has been an issue. And mostly kick ass, right, Sarge? Chris, did you say your microphone was off? I about four times I've spoken, and I didn't get a word in wise because I turned my mic off manually. And uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, 